My name is Marcus. My name is Connor. My name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. I think who Kara is, or how I would describe Kara, depends entirely upon who's playing her, because you have the option to make her multiple different people, depending on the choices she makes. But I think she, she does start out incredibly naive, incredibly innocent, and kind of hapless. I'm sure we used to be friends before I was reset. Maybe we can be friends again. She's a person who's characterized, I think, by empathy. She's a person who really, she, she just comes from her heart. You'll never leave me, right? Promise you'll never go. I promise. Kara! Are you okay? Are you hurt? Wait a minute. Leave her alone! Kara! Leave her alone! The really beautiful thing that I've, I've had the gift to be able to do is to essentially build a person from the ground up because that's what she's doing throughout the game and with every experience she has and every person she meets she's building you know first emotions and then a sense of judgment and it's sort of an exploration of what it is to be a human don't worry luther and i will be right here david and the creators have painted a really intriguing and engaging picture of a near future where we rely upon androids for a lot of our service class business, our, the, the, uh, the class that serves us, that helps us, that handles our, that is our baristas and our drivers and our housemaids. And what is humanity, where we tap into it, how and why we treat each other the way that we do. And um, my character, Marcus, has a really int intriguing journey. Becoming deviant, realizing that he actually has feelings and human qualities inside of him and it's a really incredible ascension into becoming fully realized and coming to terms with what you actually deserve better than this in life and not only do you want it for yourself but you want it for your peers we've come here to demonstrate peacefully and to tell humans that we are also living beings all we want is to live free you know what this thing dad is not your son it's a fucking machine! I think that a group that feels marginalized, feels disenfranchised, feels like they deserve and have earned access to themselves and the environment around them. Connor is analytical. Connor takes things literally. He starts in the beginning place where he's very mechanical. Uh, he feels nothing inside, of course, and it's all just a system, a protocol that he's executing to get whatever he wants to happen, which is help humans stop deviants and to find the link between deviant androids. You were designed to serve humans, not kill them. What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? Just say, I killed him. Is it that hard to say? Stop it! Stop! But of course, over the course of the story, and depending on the player's choices, Connor can grow in many different ways. He can deviate from that procedure or not. The moment of truth, Hank. Am I a living being? Or just a machine? Game after game, we try to um, challenge ourselves. For Detroit, we wanted to, first of all, to write a story that would be incredibly bending, which means the most non-linear story <laughs> that we, we've ever created. And um, we wanted really the player to have the possibility to change the story, change his own journey. When you're writing at Quantic, you're writing for an interactive medium. You know, when you're working in television, you'll put a character in a difficult situation, and you as a writing team will argue about what would that character do. But ultimately, you have to decide what happens, and you just show the audience. What's interesting about interactive drama is you bring the player into that conversation, and it changes your job slightly as a writer, because your job is to provide a narrative context in which the player can write his own story. You're giving him this kind of narrative Lego that he's going to snap together into his own shape. You also have the ability to make your audience attach themselves to your characters because the audience is in some sense responsible for what happens to the characters. It's just a few cans. Come on, let's go. We have some cash now. You 
use me to steal that money. How could you do that? I trusted you. What is a bit specific about this, uh, this scripts is how large they are. Uh, if you take a film script, there are about 100 pages. Uh, but here we have to deal with script that, that is between four and 5,000 pages. Everything becomes bigger because we don't just tend to be told within this narrative space. Is that calculated? On act three, our final act, we have around 1,000 different scenarios. And every one of those scenarios has to be as interesting, as passionate, as strong, and as emotional for the player. We want every action that the player does, every interaction that is available to serve in telling the story, and help the player understand who his character is, and build that character moment to moment. We started with the intention pretty early on that we would never lie to the player. So we implemented a visible tree structure in the game that players can consult during a scene or at the end of it, which shows exactly what they did and what they missed. There are games out there offering world exploration. We offer narrative exploration. You know, keeping control of such a, a wide and, and, and large story is is a huge challenge. So. Same thing when you shoot with actors, um, because you will need to shoot many different versions of each dialogue, of each scene. For actors, it's a huge, huge challenge. Because of the style of the game, you have so many different ways that the character can go. Every decision, it's what I call kind of choose your own adventure. Like every decision that the player makes, it's gonna open up 40 more pages of material and experience that ties in, which means as a performer, you have to try to continue to make things feel real that the player might not ever see, but also that in, in performance, it's not always connected to a previous act. It's grueling, it's hard work, but it's a great team and, and I enjoy doing it. I was really frustrated, I was, until I got to this point where I kind of was able to step outside of my own experience and even in a lot of ways, my own process and be able to step outside of that and okay, okay, this is something new, what do you need? How do I meet you there? How do I give you what you need and still feel like I'm doing what's right? And once I did that, then all of a sudden it got really fun. It was much freer and uh, having to approach it in a new way and think about the player and think about how it serves them and what I'm doing for them or what I'm letting them into. It's really, I think, uh, helped me grow in general. Remember, there's nothing on the left. That's, that's all. So it's probably all there. And then make a come first, close. But I think you would go first to check that it's safe. OK, sure. The most enjoyable thing about working in performance capture on this kind of project is that if I shot a film, I would get to do one of these endings. I get to do so many different things as Connor. Your head goes all over the place because you're trying to keep track of basically four different storylines for each different response. What's the name of my dog? Buddy? Scout. I think it's Jack. I, I can't remember. So I, I worked with physicality a lot because it was a good way to anchor myself in these different rings of the tree. As the story grows out, I know where that is physically in my body and then I can switch more continually on set and it'll be entirely up to the player to determine what order those things come out and what they look like from a distance. Like if you're playing through it, um, the culmination of all of that will be their version of Connor. I'm faster than you and I don't feel pain. You don't stand a chance against me. Listen, asshole. If it was up to me, I'd throw the lot of you in a dumpster and light a match to it. Shooting action scenes at Quantic Dream is a real challenge because these are scenes where the storytelling has to continue. It's not an action scene just to have a dose of adrenaline. The stunts have huge consequences on the rest of the story. It's really a moment where we implicate the player and tell him that the choices he makes during an action scene will have a direct impact on the evolution of his story. My biggest challenge on Detroit has been managing the large number of animations that we received from motion capture. Detroit features more than 37,000 animations, which is a huge amount to handle on a daily basis. You have to realize that the player, in his first playthrough, will miss certain scenes. This also means that we had to think of, 
conceive, and produce all the potential story paths. The character's costumes, the places, day or night, the weather. Did the character get shot in the shoulder? Did he get injured? All this consistency forced us to produce a lot of graphic assets in order to, quite simply, allow the player to have true continuity throughout the story. Honestly, we were even uh, surprised by the, the challenges that come with such a big tree structure. And uh, we, did, uh, we did our best to guarantee quality across all the, all the game and make sure that whatever path you choose within this narrative space, you will have an equally good experience. Ah, it's the mic gun. All right, I would watch this one, but I don't. Th I don't think anyone would be interested in knowing how stuff was made. <laughs> hmm. Do I? Do I watch the the making? Do I watch the making of Detroit? No, no, I don't. I watch the soundtrack of Detroit. I watch the soundtrack. For the soundtrack of the game, we tried to be very close to what is done in film. We were constantly asking at each place in the game, why are we putting music here? What is it going to say? So we focus the music on bringing emotion, which is interactive and supports the character's arc. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know I love you, don't you? You know I love you. We make games that are very narrative. We're really into interactive drama. So the soundtrack also had to go in that direction, supporting the three characters' very different stories. We really wanted three colors, three musical sound identities, and from there, having three composers made sense, since the story of Kara, Marcus, and Connor are all completely different. You recognize him? It's Carlos Ortiz. For Connor, we wanted a soundtrack that could be very cold and very um, mechanical, very machine-esque somehow. For Kara, we wanted a soundtrack that would be very moving and emotional. It was about the quest for identity, but it was also a journey about love and empathy. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic, some, something that would really represent the grand aspect of his quest. And we were very fortunate to find three incredibly talented composers, and uh, working with them has been a dream, honestly. My name is Philip Shepard and I'm a composer and a cellist and a producer and today we're at Abbey Road Studio One which is my favourite studio in the world and today we're recording the soundtrack for Cara from Become Human. So when I compose a big project, I often travel just to kind of get out you know, and get some fresh air and some inspiration. And I go um, hiking and traveling in Montana a lot. I had a, a log fire in the room that I was staying in and the flames were kind of making absolutely direct music. And it became the basis for Cara's theme. And it sounds something like this. Now, over the top of that, I found a little theme that just seemed to fit over the top, which is taking Kara's name, Kara, Kara, and just using like a two-syllable motif, and it sounds like this. Time that's fitting over. It 
So it kind of works in lots of levels. And in fact, every single theme in the score has one of those elements built into it. And it becomes sort of the DNA of every single tune. For me, writing this theme for Kara, I actually had to tap in to what it feels like to be a father to daughters. I really had to tap into everything I feel about my daughters. I'm thinking, well, if I had to write music for them and that sense of trying to protect them but also give them the freedom, that's totally where it came from. Because each composer has been given the sort of narrative responsibility for very different characters, I haven't had to sort of go into other styles. I can actually be very loyal to this particular character and sort of hopefully encapsulate her. But it means also I've suddenly become very connected to this character. And if for some reason it goes to game over early, I'm getting mortified. <laughs> you know? They're over there. Starting a new project for me personally, it's always finding the right, right texture that actually sits against picture really well. One of the biggest things is I created custom instruments for Connor. I pulled out all my vintage synthesizers um, to be able to capture this robotic person, if you will. My approach to uh, all of these custom instruments is that I hear the sound in my head. Um, and either I could just come into the piano and just be like, all right, so I'm gonna just get on the computer and just create it. i rather be able to play these instruments physically. As soon as you see Connor the first time, there is a really interesting um, thematic idea that you hear, and it's that's just made out of a Moog synthesizer, but completely manipulated in multiple ways. And it's it's robotic. It has a little bit of an emotional to it. it he's he's on his mission, so you feel that as well. So it just kind of gives you that cold, motionless, with a mission in hand that you kind of feel throughout the whole thing. Because the music evolved, one of the things that I was very weary and I was very kind of uh, focused on was the way that the music has to evolve. So my idea behind it was that Connor is a singular android that could at any point become a deviant or could actually stay as an android. So I created a more or less a uh, Connor theme and then I was able to just manipulate it in different aspects of it. Is everything okay, Lieutenant? Chris was on patrol last night. He was attacked by a bunch of deviants. I'm a human being writing for a robot. And throughout uh, Connor's journey, he meets someone, he meets a partner. So how do you deal with a robot feeling? And I've met a partner that I'm gonna work with, uh, or all of a sudden he sees a dead body. Does this robot have an imagination? Does this robot have a feeling? And if yes, how do you translate that into non-emotional music? Uh, so it basically at any point I was just like, I can't do this, I can't do this, and then I just do it. <laughs> property was damaged and fires continued to rage in several some people are asking, have androids become a threat to our security? When I first started really digging in on Mark was the transformation process. You know, Marcus is this android that evolves over the course of the game and, and really goes from kind of figuring out that he's more than just an android. You know, he's starting to develop kind of a human soul in a, in a way. Try to imagine something that doesn't exist, something you've never seen. Now concentrate on how it makes you feel and let your hand drift across the canvas. On the other side of Marcus that I really latched onto was that he almost became a savior for a lot of the other androids in the game. So when I started developing the theme for Marcus, I really made it like a church hymn. I 
want it to be very simple. I wanted to make it a chordal melody. I really wanted to make it almost like a Bach hymn. The tough thing with that is it had to be recognizable. If I made it too complex from a harmonic standpoint, it would be hard, I think, for people to kind of pick it out and recognize it. It's very acoustic derived, but it's, it's also been treated with a lot of uh, effects and things to kind of put it into the space that I, I, I felt the sound should be in. It can be beautiful, it can be haunting, it can be extremely powerful um, from an action standpoint, um, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. The music is, um, is there, but it's subliminal and it's emotional and people are, are, are feeling it and it's not distracting. And that's tricky with a game like this, where you have to have a lot of ins and outs like that, where, where the music kind of has to get in and out of these moments. This is a war we're fighting with the humans. If we fail, they'll destroy us. I think the game's been put together so well, where I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't ruining the emotion. I gotta be honest, when we first started on this path, I said, oh man, this could be pretty messy, you know? I mean, it could feel disconnected, and but I mean, it's amazing how they really guided us and got us to really kind of all be in the same world, but at the same time feeling completely different. So it's really gonna stand out and kind of be one of those games where um, people are really gonna notice the music and kind of how it was crafted and, you know, and all the hard work that went into making, being able to pull it off in a graceful way. For starters, what should I call you? I'm Chloe. And you, what's your name? Oh, uh, John. My name is John. Delighted to meet you, John. Could you tell us a little about yourself and what you can do, Chloe? Of course. I'm the first personal assistant built by CyberLife. I take care of most everyday tasks like cooking, housework, or managing your appointments, for example. Mm. And I understand you're the first android to have passed the Turing test. Could you tell us a little more about that? I really didn't do much, you know. I just spoke with a few humans to see if they could tell the difference between me and a real person. It was a really interesting experience. But this is the first time in history that man has created a machine more intelligent than himself. I gather your brain can perform several billion billion operations per second, is that right? Absolutely, but I only exist thanks to the intelligence of the humans who designed me. And, you know, they have something I could never have. Really? And what's that? A soul. Hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Everything. Will be all right. Everything will be all right. Fight on just a little while longer. Fight on just a little while longer. Fight on just a little while longer. Everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. We will sing on just a little while. Sing on. 
Bye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby. Cradle and all. Rock a bye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby. Cradle and all. Rock a bye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come. In the space of a few years, androids have completely transformed the world in which we live. By letting androids into our homes and factories, the CyberLife company has made them everyday technology. The founder of CyberLife, Elijah Kamsky, is a very discreet man. Despite being the CEO of the highest valued company in the world and being voted man of the year by Century Magazine, he remains a mystery for most people. That's why we at KNC are so excited to be here as CyberLife opens its doors for the first time. Elijah Kamsky, could you please tell us where we are? Certainly, and welcome. We're currently in CyberLife's production center in Detroit, where all models are designed and manufactured. More than 10,000 androids come off the production line every day. Fascinating. Could you tell us what your goal was when you founded CyberLife? <laughs> Well, I simply wanted to use technology to carry out all of our most annoying and repetitive tasks so we'd have more time to enjoy life. I imagine you must have faced many challenges. Yes, there were technical challenges, but the hardest thing was to design an object that we would want to welcome into our homes. We had to imagine a machine in our own image that resembles us in every way, that moves, breathes, blinks like us, but yet is smarter and more capable than any human being. Let me show you around. We're here in production unit four. Could you explain in a few words how the androids are... We use machines to manufacture machines. The removable parts are assembled on a production line, and then we apply a synthetic skin to the whole body. A human operator checks the cognitive abilities with a pre-established protocol, and finally, the android is conditioned and 
sent out throughout the country. Here's the result. Say something. Hello. I am a RZ400 model. How can I be of service? You can go now. Our androids are already replacing humans in many fields. For example, they represent more than 80% of all university professors and 63% of all medical staff. Tomorrow they'll replace our soldiers, and who knows, maybe one day, our leaders, to make the best decisions in humanity's interest. Come on. Replacing humans with machines has led to record unemployment of hmm. 28%. What do you think about the situation? Uh, <laughs> okay. The first steam engines also caused an increase in unemployment. But no one today would imagine turning back the clock. Artificial intelligence makes everyday lives easier. Nothing can stop progress. What's happening here is inevitable. These days, more and more people choose to live with an android rather than another human being. Does this development worry you? <laughs> Everything's much easier with an android. They obey your orders without ever complaining. They can cook, discuss philosophy with you, have intimate relationships according to your desires. They never say no. Obviously, they are the perfect partner. Everyone deserves happiness. Why deprive yourself of so-called moral reasons when a machine can make you happy? Many science fiction books tell the story of how machines become more intelligent than us and end up confronting us. Aren't you worried about that possibility? I understand the irrational fears about artificial intelligence, but I assure you, that will never happen with a CyberLife android. They're designed to obey humans. They're machines. They can't ever develop uh, any sort of desires or, or form of consciousness. Are you sure? You can trust me. <laughs>